Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to another episode on Relentless Pursuit of Purpose, where our goal is to help everyone enter into a confirmed, confident, and eternal relationship with the source of all life and purpose. If you've not already done so, please make sure and hit the subscribe button so that you never miss a video or an interview such as we have tonight. I am pleased to have uh, Dr. Zwiernik uh, joining. Am I saying that right? Uh, it's rink at the end instead of Nick, but other than that, rink. you're good. Zwier, Zwier rink. Got it. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm, I've had a lot of the other uh, speakers and scientists from Reasons to Believe, and it's great to finally have you. So why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself and your field of uh, study? So my field of study is what's called uh, very high energy astrophysics, which is just a really long term for saying I look at uh, high energy processes in the universe, things that make gamma rays, cosmic rays, things like that. Uh, so, you know, I've done stuff where we build telescopes that can find the gamma rays that come through the atmosphere and make these particle showers that emit light we can detect on the ground. More recently, for the last decade or so, I've been working on an experiment called GAPS which is a balloon experiment that uh, we're looking for a particular type of particle that if we find it will tell us what dark matter is. Wow. In doing all that, I enjoy doing the scientific research, but I also work for an organization called Reasons to Believe, which looks at how science and Christianity relate to one another and how I would argue they that science and Christianity belong together and validate and point to the idea that there is a God who created us, wants to have a relationship with us as described in the Bible. Wow. Amen to that. Um, so gamma rays. Wow. This is <laughs> already way out of my league. <laughs> um, well, let's jump in and just so we can all be kind of caught up on the same ideas as we walk through this. Um, let me, I should say for everybody that's watching, we're talking through this book, Testable Faith, uh, the chapters that, that Jeff contributed to this book, which is really an anth anthology. So you can actually call Reasons to Believe and get a, a free copy of that book. Um, so we've had Dr. Ross, Hugh Ross, Dr. Fazal Rana, and uh, Ken Samples will be uh, coming soon. So let us jump right in. And my first question is just kind of getting our definitions uh, correct. Uh, you wrote that scientists have thrown numerous experimental tests at the theory of general relativity to see if it is valid or not. And it has passed every test with outstanding success. Mm -hmm. One of the best established and best accepted scientific theories known today. So can you kind of in layman's term explain what the theory of general relativity details and why it is obviously so widely accepted today? So the general theory of relativity is our best scientific description of how gravity works. So, uh, yeah, we all know what gravity does. You go outside, you jump up, you fall down. Uh, we, we see the effects of it. But there's been just a longstanding question of how does it work? And that was one of the geniuses ideas of Isaac Newton was the recognition that the same thing that causes an apple to fall to the ground is the same cause of why the moon orbits around the earth and the earth orbits around the sun. Effectively, the moon is falling towards the earth because of gravity, but it does so in a way that causes it to orbit instead of actually hitting. And so we've been trying to understand how gravity works. Now there's this problem that arises when you look at Newton's description of gravity and uh, how other things work and, and how um, electricity and magnetism work. And so uh, just the general idea is if you take Newton's idea of gravity or Newtonian mechanics, and then you say, all right, let's ride along on a train and I throw a ball, well, everybody knows that if you look out or you're watching from the outside, that when you throw the ball, the ball goes at the speed that the train is going plus the speed with which I threw it. Fine and dandy. But when you come along and now you turn on a flashlight, the flashlight's moving at some speed because of the train, but the light coming out always moves at the speed of light. And so what Einstein recognized was, and, and others recognize, is that the laws of physics look different depending on how you were moving. And so Einstein set out and said, what would it take to develop a theory where the laws of physics were constant and looked the same at all times for all, observer, of all observers at all places? And it was that philosophical idea that led to the development of general relativity. So general relativity explains the dynamics of how gravity works and things interact 
uh, explains why galaxies move the way they do, why they rotate the way they do, why galaxies and stars are attracted, all of that. General relativity is our explanation for how basically anything big that has mass in the universe works and some more stuff than that. All right. I appreciate that. Well, um, as you said in your, in your intro, there's a, not just, um, closeness with Christianity and science. Like you said, they're, they're kind of intertwined. If we really, if we're really honest with our approaches to both, um, you wrote in your, in the book here, let me see if I can pull this one up. Um, let's see. You said it so happens that physics being predictable is a foundational requirement for life. First, why is that? And how does the predictability of physics help us understand why the scientific founders were mostly Christian? <laughs> well, it, it flows out of this, what I would argue is a very biblical idea. And, and there's kind of two components to this. There's this biblical idea that the universe behaves in reliably order, orderly and predictable ways. You know, you got passages where prophet, the prophet Jeremiah is talking to the nation of Israel and he's saying, you know, God is saying this, I'm going to do this. And you can count on him keeping his promises. And if you want to know why or how reliable he is, just go look at the heavens. And what they'll know is that Every day the sun comes up, every evening the moon, the sun goes down, the moon orbits, it's reliable, it's orderly, it's predictable. And that's what general relativity is enshrining, is this idea that the laws of physics are the same everywhere. And in fact, when you think about that, what Jeremiah is saying, he's actually saying the same God who is going to keep his promises is the God who is also orchestrating the way the universe works. And he upholds it so reliably, so consistently, that we can talk about these things called laws of physics. Now, they didn't use that terminology. That's not the terminology Jeremiah used, but that's effectively what's going on there. The, law, the way the universe behaves is reliable. We can go out and study it, and by studying it, we can understand how the creator is sustaining it. That's the motivation of a lot of the early scientists was, how did God create the world? What did he do? He's orderly. He's reliable. He's we expect there to be predictability about the universe, so let's go out and look, and lo and behold, that's what we find. We find the universe to be a very orderly, reliable, predictor, predictable entity that we can study and understand. That's a little different. Uh, there, that's one component. There's another component to that statement about predictability that's important that relates to how many dimensions there are. But that's really the central idea there. Well, now I'm curious. <laughs> so explain the dimensions aspect. So as scientists have studied how the universe works, you know, we can talk about laws of physics and there's certain a certain mathematical form to them. Mm -hmm. And what scientists have gone along and done is ask the question, what happens if the dimensions of the universe were different? So we live in a, a universe with three space, three large spatial dimensions, one time dimension. And so if you want to specify where Jeff Zwerink is, you got to give a, a effectively a length, a width, and a height. But you also have to give a time because if you say just here, you know, the X, Y, and Z length, width, height here, but don't say today, I'm not going to be here tomorrow and I wasn't here yesterday. So you got to give three large spatial dimensions, one time dimension. Well, now you ask the question, what happens if those number of dimensions were different? And if there were fewer dimensions, you wouldn't have the complexity that life requires. If there were more spatial dimensions, there are no stable structures like atoms and planets. That also makes it difficult for life. But you can ask the question, what happens if you change the number of time dimensions? And given the way the laws of physics work, if you change the number of time dimensions, things are not predictable. And that doesn't mean, well, Jeff Zwerink doesn't understand how the universe works, so he can't predict what's happening. It's that what goes on right now doesn't correlate with what goes on in the future. So things can happen in a very random haphazard. You just don't know what's going to happen. And so every form of life relies on being able to sense the environment, say, oh, there's nutrients there, there's danger over there, or whatever it may be. You move towards the nutrients away from the danger. If physics is not predictable, that is not possible. And so if you change the number of time dimensions, given the way the laws of physics are structured, the universe becomes unpredictable and life can't exist. And so that was one of the early evidence of evidences of fine tuning in our universe, that it has the right spatial and time dimensions so that life can work. Wow, that's interesting. So um, secondary question, just 
does this put to bed certain theories? I don't know how many dimensions string theory posits, but you know, it seems like the more dimensions get posited, the more universes get posited as questions get harder to answer. But that seems to be going the wrong direction of what is possible. Does that make sense what I'm asking? Yes, it does. And you'll notice that when I said that, I keep talking about three large spatial dimensions okay. because the extra dimensions that string theory and other theories are talking about are very small, tightly curled up dimensions. Gotcha. So you kind of think of that like a road. You know a road is three-dimensional, but it kind of acts two-dimensional. And if your tire is big enough, it looks like a two-dimensional surface. But if you get down on tiny enough scales, you can see the bumps and everything. You can see mm. the third dimension. That's kind of what these other dimensions are. Gotcha. And yeah, I think we'll probably touch on it a little later. If you want to figure out how to reconcile quantum mechanics and general relativity, you need some more dimensions in there, but they've got to be small dimensions. They can't be the large ones like we encounter and experience every day. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. All right. So now that we got some kind of foundation laid, um, you mentioned that there are certain foundational concepts scientists need in order for the scientific process. Let me see if I can. In order for the scientific process or enterprise rather to progress consistently and endure over time. So I know you, you've given us the framework for why um, these, these four big dimensions are kind of necessary for life to exist. And the Bible kind of affirms this as well. So in general, how is a theistic worldview actually helpful to science scientists who are engaged in their field or how can it be? Well, well this is what I recognized as I, one, just read some of my colleagues, particularly Ken Sample's work, but also as you just think about the different ways that different worldviews look at the world. Uh, you know, I think about Greek mythology. Okay, so what goes on in Greek mythology? If that's the way the world works, is there's all these gods kind of doing what they want kind of whenever they want to. What sort of world do you get if that's the correct explanation? Yeah. Well, some days it's rainy because the gods are upset. Some days there's lightning bolts. Sometimes it's sunny. You know, who knows what you're going to get? How do you do science in that sort of world? And so if Greek mythology is the correct way to look at it, you wouldn't expect science to have much utility. You wouldn't, science couldn't develop because what happened today and what happened tomorrow isn't something that's orderly and regular. It's at the capricious whims of the deities that are in control. Yeah. Or you take somebody like uh, Buddha. And I remember reading a book called uh, Siddhartha when I was in college. And, you know, basically Siddhartha, I forget exactly all that went on, but I remember at some point in time, he ended up just sitting out by the river, watching the passage of the river go by and recognizing that detachment from the world is what brings enlightenment and true joy. If that's the right way to look at it, why would we study the physical world? The physical world is what gets in the way of what we're truly desiring. Mm. Uh, you know, kind of Hindu Hindu philosophy has that has that same sort of Hindu worldview has that same sort of the world is bad, the spiritual is good. So if if the world's bad or a de it's detachment from the world is what we're striving for, why would we invest the resources into developing a scientific enterprise? Mm. Or you know, maybe take some of the uh, Eastern basic religions where you know. The, the, the tree is a God and the rock is a God and all of us are God and we want to be one with God. You know, one, if that's the right way to look at it, do we put the rock and the tree in a test tube to figure out how they work or do we worship the God? You know, I mean, it's you just ask the question, yeah. given the way the or given the way our worldview works, what do you expect of the world and would you expect science to develop in that? And the hard part of recognizing all this or seeing all this is that when you if you've grown up in the United States, Western civilization, and actually the Judeo-Christian worldview so permeates the way we think about this, it's like, well, duh, who wouldn't, who, this is obviously the right way. Things are orderly, they're regular, we can do science, but not all worldviews support science. And particularly right. one that's coming up is, you know, if, if naturalism is correct, just the physical world is all there is, you run into this question and it's key to science actually developing is why do we trust what our minds think about the world to be actually true of the world? If we're just an arrangement of atoms that's happened over time for whatever, there's no reason to trust that my arrangement of atoms has any correspondence to the way the world actually works. 
And so yeah. why is the Judeo-Christian worldview important? It's like if you ask what, a sci what scientists need to be true for science to work, the Judeo-Christian worldview is the only one that anchors all of those philosophical necessities for science to work. Wow. Yes, I would agree with that. Um, I love this one, this one chapter you have titled, let me see if I can pull this up. And you said, would the discovery of ET disprove Christianity and must ET exist? Um, if I have any younger viewers, I can't imagine that they're that young, but some may not even know who ET is. It's crazy how I'm getting older and now it's like a whole different generation. But there was a movie with this little alien guy named ET, extraterrestrial. That's how advanced we were at that time. <laughs> there wasn't even a real name. Um, and, you know, since then or probably before then, people have been looking for aliens, waiting for aliens. There's reports last year that there's been aliens. I mean, people are obsessed with this this idea of, of aliens. And so that's fine. Um, but I think it's a, maybe sometimes an over uh, fascination. <laughs> um expecting them to come and all this type of thing. But for our purposes, first of all, that's a great title for a chapter. And how does this question actually affect a Christian worldview or does it? Well, there's a, a pretty popular idea out there. And the way I've heard it articulated, you know, it's articulated many ways, but it basically has this idea that, you know, We've got all these religions on the earth. They're kind of just developed. They're tribal religions, people coming up with ideas. But if one day, you know, we're sitting there watching and ET or, you know, and aliens come down and on the White House lawn and they get out, all the world's religions would have to be rewritten because they're just shown to be false at that point. Right. Now, I think there's some assumptions built into that conclusion. And that's kind of what I'm getting at with this chapter is. Would if if ET genuinely shows up, and I'm not just talking about you know bacterial life floating around, we find bacterial life on some planet. If some sort of sentient being actually showed up here on Earth, would that disprove Christianity? And my original thought was yes. And then as I investigated, I realized, you know, Christians have thought about this for a while. We're kind of you know, science is almost the latecomer to the game, and Christians have have thought about this. So the answer is not. Yes, it would disprove Christianity. In fact, it's the actually the opposite question is no, it, it would actually validate Christianity. Hmm. And how so how would that work? Or in your in your estimation? I agree, but how well so so there's two things at play there. One is if you're gonna say ET landing on the White House lawn is disproving Christianity, there's an assumption built in there of what would our interactions with ET actually show. And so, you know, there's just this general idea that if Christians are arguing that everything's so designed and everything's so rare that humanity only happened once, well, the moment we have another example, that shows Christianity's wrong. But that's not what Christians are actually saying. And really what the argument, the, the, the assumption that's built in there is, okay, so E.T. walks off the, the spaceship and we get up and start talking and we say, well, what's the true meaning of the world? And you'd expect the, the assumption built into there is that ET will get off there and say, well, there's this lifeless or you know, this vast universe, which is just an arrangement of atoms and that's all that exists and therefore there is no God. There's that assumption built in there. But you know, mm -hmm. think about it. What happens if ET comes off the, the spaceship and says, you know what? There is this incredible God who's created the vast universe and he's given us the technology that allows us to traverse this. And we want to tell you about how powerful and loving this God is. You see how the assumptions you bring yeah. in lead to very different conclusions there. Right. But more important than that, you know, so I think we need to identify those assumptions. Mm -hmm. But you look throughout the history of Christian thought, and Christians have thought about whether if aliens exist or not. In fact, you've got Christians vehemently arguing with one another, some saying, yes, Earth is the only place where there's life, and others saying, no, God's created life on many planets out there, you know, Galileo and Kepler, two very prominent scientists, both devout Christians. Galileo said, the earth is the only place with life. Kepler said, no, God created life on all these other places. Now we know Kepler was wrong in that there is no life on Mars. There's no life on Jupiter, you know, but the question still remains, is this the only place God's created life or might he have created life other places? And that's where, we start thinking about what the Bible says, and now we can start asking some really interesting theological questions. Yeah, no, I think I think that's that's a really good point. And so, what would um, 
let's say there's there's um an alien comes and they i don't know they don't do either of those things they get off and you know do we evangelize to them or do we like in th those kind of questions come up sometimes uh what what would you say and what how would our our i mean obviously this is all hypothetical but <laughs> yeah, what, what would what would you say well, I think the first thing, the the most logical question or the most logical things to do is to just go understand what they know. Uh, you know, and this is where, as as I've read the literature, of, you know, what have theologians said about this? You know, when it comes to how would aliens, you know, what does the Bible say about aliens? And to a short answer, you can say not much. It says God created the universe. Well, if he created the universe, would he create the alien? Okay, yes. Yeah, so he's still the creator. Uh, you know, he put humanity in his image in the garden. Um, well, we don't know exactly how that would play out out there, but there's this fall where we rebelled against God. And then, you know, thousands of years later, Christ becomes incarnate. God incarnate lives in, you know, God or in Jesus, both fully God, fully man, dies on the cross to reconcile and pay for our rebellion against God. Those who accept that are eventually are going to live in heaven uh, where, you know, in, in God's presence throughout eternity. And so the question is, if we found other life, what, how does that, that story play out in there? And, and to, to what's important to remember is that this is, you know, this talking about who God is, you know, that God's going to be the same here as he is there. God isn't changing, but the redemption story could be different. Yeah. For example, it could be that there are creatures that God has created that are sentient that never rebelled against him. They wouldn't need evangelizing because they're in a harmonious relationship. Right. You know, the C.S. Lewis explored this in the space trilogy. You know, one of the planets that he was talking about had aliens who never rebelled against God. Hmm. So other theological, here's where it kind of expands what we, you know, where, where we ask the question, what would still work and still be sound theology? Well, it could be that these creatures rebelled against God, but there's no means of salvation for them. Mm. Now, we kind of chafe at that, but you look at what happened to the angelic realm. They rebelled against God, and there was no means of salvation. It's a one-time choice. You're either with God or you're with Satan. You know, there, there, there isn't a redemption there. Yeah. That, that might be. Or maybe there's a different means of redemption than what he's revealed here. Uh, you know, I, I, and I don't even know what that would be because all he's revealed is what the redemption plan he has for humanity. Yeah. Or maybe it is the case that, you know, again, think of the theology there. You've got God, the triune God, one God in three persons. The second person of the Godhead takes on a human form because humans are made in God's image. So the second person of the Godhead and Jesus takes on a human form, fully God, fully man, dies for our sins because he's God. He can atone for the sins because he's human. He can atone for the sins. Maybe. Now, we're created in God's image, but we don't fully reflect God's image. So maybe there are other creatures he's created in his image that have an image different than ours. Mm. And so maybe Jesus comes and takes on a Klingon nature. Mm -hmm. Now, all of these have a little bit of, well, you know, I mean, a little bit of uncomfort in me thinking about them. Yeah. But nonetheless, all of them were laid out by Christian theologians long before science could ever even begin to address the question of might there be life out there. So Christians okay. thought about this long before scientists even came to play, come to the table to play the game. Oh, that's really interesting. I hadn't uh, known the history of that in the Christian thought. So long before spaceships were even a, or even rocket ships were even a, a thing, they were still pondering other planets and life on other planets, which is really interesting. It really is. I mean, I, I I found this book that kind of talks about it just documents various writings where people are talking about whether there's life out there. And they've got documents dating back to prior to Christ where people have been addressing this topic. And wow. yeah, I kind of jokingly say it wouldn't surprise me that Adam and Eve were in the garden arguing about this. <laughs> it's such a fascinating topic. Yeah, <laughs> that's funny. All right. Well, um, you kind of outlined it. I don't know if there's anything else you want to say. I had another question that it said um, you wrote about how some theologians have long contemplated what other intelligent life on other worlds could reveal. I think this is what you were just talking about. So we don't have to go over it again. Um, but I think you, you outlined some of the proposals that have been put on the table in, in time past. So we'll go ahead and, and skip past that. 
Well, well, I would oh. make a comment, and this, and you know, just because I, I want to explicitly say it, is that one of the things I found when I began addressing topics that seem like they're a threat to Christianity, and that's anything from, oh, it, you know, is finding water on Mars a problem, or is the multiverse a problem, or is extraterrestrial? They seem like they're threats to Christianity. And what I found is, as I've gone and dug into them, one, I, I try and understand the science better. I think that's important. But often, they always drive me into a better theological understanding. And I found that Christianity is a very robust worldview. It, it can handle scrutiny. I have yet to plumb a depth of scrutinizing Christianity where it hasn't withstood with flying colors. And so I would encourage people to just be willing to go dig into those topics because as I've done that, my confidence in the truth of Christianity has grown tremendously. I can definitely attest to that as well. And um, I'm an apologist, as you know, or I think you know. And um, so, you know, doing what I do and definitely what you do, we have to read a lot. Mm -hmm. And plus, you know, in getting my master's, I had to read a lot, obviously. Um, and then before that, I was already being trained by some of the leading apologists of our of our day, mm -hmm. which was more. Re and so when I say reading, not reading just Christian sources. In fact, in my right. master's, the first two assignments were reading David Hume and. Uh, oh, man, why am I drawing a blank? He uh, converted to theism before he died. Anthony Flew. Anthony Flew. Yeah. So those are my first two assignments, <laughs> definitely not Christian sources. And so, but I think, like you said, that helps me. It didn't, it wasn't necessarily my goal going in, but it did once I worked through it, help me have even more confidence in, in our, in our faith. So I think that's something that definitely everybody should, should engage in on your own, whether you get a master's or all that type of stuff or not, just, just keep reading and, and, um, read out of your comfort zone. <laughs> well, and, and, and uh, among other things that I found it does is that it helps me understand other people's viewpoints. Better. Yes, yes. You know, especially in today's kind of social media thing what I, or social media environment, what I've found is that a lot of people are chomping at the bit to make their statement and not spending a lot of time understanding what the other person's actually saying. Oh, welcome to my comment section. <laughs> <laughs> and I just find that the more I understand what the other person's position is, one, I just find it interesting to learn that. But two, if I am going to make a comment, I'm going to be more likely to actually make a comment that might cause them to think differently or consider something because I understand what they're actually thinking instead of just yeah. trying to force my position into some interesting way. That's that's really important. I agree. Um, yeah, it's, it's so important that we have better non-online conversations, especially I, I try not to get into social media debates because they don't really go anywhere. But um, yeah, it's it's a crazy world we live in now. Yeah. Well, how does the free will that God created us with um, play into our understanding of the possible redemption of other life? So I know we're still dealing in the hypothetical range, but, you know, let's just think this all the way through. <laughs> That is a question that I'm I'm pretty sure theologians have been thinking about for for long. I, I have no hope or dream that I'm actually going to resolve this question. Yeah. But one thing I I do find interesting, and and again, just looking at what Scripture reveals, it's like here the two forms of life we know that exist that are sentient and aware of God and have a relationship with God, humanity and the angelic realm. Mm -hmm. Now, when we look at the angelic realm, there is a live in God's presence aspect to how they are. There's, you know, they're spiritual beings. They're, they don't have physical limitations, although they can interact with the physical world at some level. God's given them that capacity that at some level, though, it seems like there's no doubt to the angelic realm who God is and whether he exists or not. Uh, you know, in fact, the issue is not do you know God exists? In fact, I forget which which author said that in the Bible it was like the angels know God exists in James. They just, yeah, they just rebel again. Yeah, you know, they're just in rebellion against him. Mm -hmm. Now, with humanity, though, I find it a little different scenario. I I think there's abundant evidence for someone who's seeking for God. There's abundant evidence that points to his existence. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so it's not like I'm just. I'm a Christian and I'm just believing and hoping it's true and I don't really have any evidence. No, I'm a Christian because I think that's the best explanation of the data that I see. 
And so I think there's great and strong reasons to think Christianity is actually true. Yeah. But I also find that there doesn't seem to be enough evidence to compel you to believe that Christianity is true. And it seems like God has set it up that way. And I think that's related to this idea of free will, that if, and, and, and this is, a you know, I'll get to heaven and I'll get to ask, you know, the greatest theologian or maybe maybe ask Jesus himself, you know, okay, what's, yeah. what's, what's the answer here? But it does seem like that as you are more compelled to know who God is, the less choice you have in what you're going to do. So I think our free will is almost in some way a reflection of the fact that God has veiled himself. Not he's veiled so that it's impossible to see. He's given us plenty of clues, lots of evidence and arguments. But it's not like I'm not compelled to believe God exists. And that's part of what allows me to have free will. Now, I don't think I have genuine free will at this point because there are so many things that influence what I do that are outside my control. But any... I, you know, one of the just questions I have is how does a God who's sovereign and in control of everything create creatures with free will? And I don't have a, you know, the, I, this is the question that people have been, theologians have been pondering. For one centuries. I deal with a lot. <laughs> yeah. But I do think there is this connection between, there is enough evidence to convince you that Christianity is true, not enough to compel you that it's true. And that little bit of hiddenness is what allows us to actually exercise some sort of free will in there. Yeah, I totally agree. I was trying to um, pull up this quote. Um, yes. So let me share this. It's actually from um, Blaise Pascal. Um, famous mathematician slash slash theologian. Are you able to see that? A uh, little small. I'm going to make my screen a little larger here. That'll help. Okay. Um, so if there were no obscurity, man would not be sensible of his corruption. If there were no light, man would not hope for a remedy. Thus, it is not only fair, but advantageous to us that God be partly hidden and partly revealed, since it is equally dangerous to man to know God without knowing his own wretchedness and to know his own wretchedness without knowing God. That's a far more eloquent way of saying <laughs> that. <I> articulate. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And it, and it's kind of this, uh, I think in, in, in our in philosophy, we call it the divine hiddenness problem, mm -hmm. uh, the hiddenness of God, or as people want to term it that. And to your point, I think you said it great actually too, that it's not that God is trying to make himself hard to find. Right. It's that he can't be fully present with us without overwhelming us. It's it's just like Moses couldn't look directly right. at the glory. So we can only take but so much, which also means if, if I'm overcome by his presence, I cannot of my own volition choose to love him because his love will be so strong that it's going to compel me. Mm. whether I want to or not. Right. And so I always say true love that is not freely given can never be trusted. Interesting. And, and so God yeah. wants us to have the freedom to, to make an honest yes to him and an honest, I love you to him. Well, and th this, uh, yeah, I've been trying, uh, thinking a little bit about this. Uh, I, I wondered this question, okay, why would someone who knows what Christianity has to offer, that there's a, an offer of eternal happiness and joy being in God's presence uh, you know, no pain, no suffering, you know, kind of a, eternal bliss, you know, internal joy and happiness in God's presence. Why would somebody want to reject that? Yeah. And, and what did a, one of the ideas that came to my mind, and I'm going you know, to throw this out here for discussion a little bit, is it's not so much a do I want the blessings, but the blessings come with a requirement, not a work, but a requirement, because that requirement is that instead of my autonomy to make my choices and my decisions, that eternal bliss and joy comes by properly submitting myself to what God has designed for me. And so it's my free will. Instead of saying, I can do what I want, it's like, I want what God wants. And there, yeah. there's a submission that comes with it. Yes. That right. makes sense. I, I could see myself rebelling against that. I think yes. I, I, I'm not. I, I practically day to day you do, but in in the big term, I don't rebel against that. But I can see why people would rebel against that. 
It, yeah, and you said it right. I mean, um, Abdul Murray had said that it, it's not can we trust the validity as far as the manuscripts themselves of the Bible. As it is people's not willingness, their people's unwillingness to submit to what's in it. Yeah. So if it said different words, they would have no problem. Oh, it's definitely historical. It's definitely, um, you know, 20,000 manuscripts. I know it's solid. I know it's valid. But in there it says... <laughs> I am the way, the truth, and life. And there it says, these are sins. You know, so if it didn't have the stuff in it, <laughs> people wouldn't ever have a problem. And, and um, I think that's, that is, you know, boils, boils down the problem of sin in the world is that, so there was, a, I don't know what theologians said it, but at the end of the day, they said, you will either say to God, your will be done, or God will say to you, your will be done. Yeah. Well, and, it, and it, it just kind of changed the way I was thinking about Christianity. And this is a fairly recent thought. I mean, it didn't radically change it, but I just this recognition that if Christianity is true, the best place for me to be is in submission to God. And, and I, I tend to think that the best place for me to be is following what God's commanded me to do. Mm -hmm. And there's a subtle difference in there. It's the subtle difference is I'm choosing to follow God's commands as a choose to as as opposed to, you know, if I follow God's commands well enough, he's going to bless. If I don't, he's got, you know, there's a there's kind of a I'm in control aspect of that. Whereas this is. If God's created me, he knows what I'm designed for and what's the best for me. And I want to find that and align myself with that. It's yes. it's a submission rather than an autonomy driving the obedience. Absolutely. So that's actually a lot of the reason the name of my channel is Relentless Pursuit of Purpose. Interesting. Um, because a purpose, I believe, can only be grounded and found in God. And so when you do what you just said, that's how people find the purpose he has for them. So, right. Absolutely. Um, if only that were more comfortable all the time. It yes, is so I know. <laughs> <laughs> I totally agree. Um, all right. So now we'll get back to a little science. And right. you said quantum mechanics is one of the two most successful scientific models ever developed. The other is, as we talked about, general relativity. So now we talked about general relativity and defining that. Can you kind of give a, a high level view? What is quantum physics, or I'm sorry, what is quantum uh, mechanics, and and you know, kind of why is there so much talk about it nowadays? Yeah, so if general relativity is the dynamics that governs the large, you can think of quantum mechanics as the uh, what governs the the small, and both of those had two radical ideas. the The radical idea that ended up coming out of general relativity is that instead of space and time being these entities that exist that everything happens within, that space and time are actually dynamic quantities, that mass actually warps the fabric of space. The faster I move through space, the slower I move through time. That time may actually have a beginning and an end. Those were radical concepts that came out of general relativity. Mm -hmm. So now switch to the small scale. Again, the idea that space and time, things are continuous, they're, they're fundamental things that just are the way they are. Well, what we end up finding is that uh, in the quantum world, there are two things. One, things are not continuous, they're discrete. So I could have, you know, I could imagine pushing my laptop a little bit, a little bit harder, a little bit harder. There's no, there's no limit to how precisely I could push it. Turns out that when you go to the quantum level, uh, when you ask what sort of energy can be exerted or given off, it comes in chunks. And there's no, it's not like it slowly goes from one chunk. It comes out in either this big chunk or this big chunk. That's quanta. They're, they're quanta. That's what the, the term quantum comes from. Exactly. And so it's this radical idea that at the fundamental level, not only is space and time not continuous, it's discrete, it comes in chunks. But even more radical than that, that there are fundamental limits on what we can actually know. That, for example, I can I can measure the position and how fast my stuff is moving seemingly to arbitrary precision. It's just a matter of how good equipment can I make? Mm -hmm. When you start talking about measuring an electron, it turns out that the better you know the position, the less you know about how fast it's moving. And the more 
you know about how fast it's moving, the less you know about where it is. That there are fundamental limits on what we can know. Sounds bizarre, but it is you take those ideas and work them out into mathematical structures that allow us to predict how things work, incredibly successful at predicting how the world works. Wow. Well, that is uh, good to know because I'm, you know, I'm all for science as long as it is, uh, you know, for good purposes and, and, and giving us a better understanding of what God did. Um, I think one of the things we miss, and maybe you don't, because because as the work you do, you are a believer as well. I was talking with a environmental biologist, I think she was, but she's a Christian, but she was talking about her friend who's no longer a Christian. And she said, he said something that was so sad that didn't dawn on me or her till later, but he would used to do these um, nature walks or walk in the woods or whatever. And, you know, if you're, that's your field, that makes sense. And he said, after he stopped being a Christian, she was like, what's different? And he said, when I walk through the forest now, I don't have anybody to thank. So interesting. And I was like, wow, that is really profound. Mm -hmm. Because I think one of the things, the more I learn from you all and other scientists, it makes me in more awe when I go outside. So it's a better experience. Um, you know, I look up sometimes, you know, sit out back and I look up at the clouds and the sky and the stars, and you're like, they don't look that far away, <laughs> but they are. Um, and you're just in awe. I'm in awe. And so I think taking, I don't think, I think some people think uh, we get God, the creator out of the equation and we can just have a better appreciation for everything on our own. And I think it's the opposite. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, can you just elaborate on how you've seen quantum mechanics kind of play into even what you do um, for a living? Well, that, that was, a, I was just having an interesting discussion with a colleague of mine today talking about how big is the universe? And, and, you know, and there's, there's a connection to quantum mechanics. I'll get to it in just a second. But as we start, as we go out and ask the question, how big is the universe? The, the, actually, the answer is we don't know right? because there's a limit to how far out we can see. The fact that the universe has only been around for 14 billion years and that the speed of light has a finite value means that there's only so far that light can travel in the history of the universe. And so, you know, as I look out at the moon, that takes about one second to get to me. The sun's eight and a half minutes. The Andromeda galaxy is two and a half million light years, or sorry, two and a half million years. The further away I get, the longer it takes light to travel. Well, the fact that the universe is only 14 billion years means there's only so far out I can go. Mm -hmm. And what I recognize is this, that the amount of the universe I can see is actually very small compared to the amount of stuff that actually exists out there. Yeah. And I thought about that because, you know, you read scripture, God's revealed himself in scripture. He's revealed himself in creation. Mm -hmm. We know that scripture tells us a lot about who God is, but God is so much bigger than what's revealed in scripture. I mean, there's so much more to know about God than what he's revealed to us in scripture. And lo and behold, when we look at his general revelation, there's more to know about the, the what we don't know is far bigger than what we can know. Mm. Well, now we start looking at the small scales and it's not that, well, we just need to get better technology. It's like you get down to the, the, the small scales and you also run into this boundary. There's a limit to how much we can know about how big it is, but there's also a limit to how much we can know about how small it can be. Wow. And it's like God has said, all right, I will reveal enough of enough of who I am through scripture that you can know how to relate to me and, you know, and you will never exhaust what there is to know. And there's always going to be more to learn. Yeah. But I'm going to build a creation that has that same feature built into it. You're going to study it for as long as you can, and you're still not going to know everything there is to know about it. But even what you do know doesn't tap into what's possible to know. And I was like, I just see this parallel between how God has revealed himself in scripture and how God's revealed himself in creation. And the more I know about scripture, I'm like, oh, that is so cool. And I, I have that same phenomena when I look at this creation as well. Yeah. Yeah. You and me both. It's, um, you know, just walking on the beach, you see the waves. Um, uh, just we take it for granted. But that regularity of the pattern from the moon and the like, it's just... It all works and it works so well that we sometimes don't notice it, right? We just well, take it. Well, 
not only is it so regular and orderly, but think about this. So you go out, lie down, just close your, close your eyes and listen. The ocean is really loud. I mean, it's just you think about how much energy is being put into the shore as the waves come crashing in. Yeah. And it just happens over and over. And it's like, I just get tired trying to think about how much energy it takes. And yeah. though I can understand how waves work and how the energy is propagated, and I can write down the equations and do all the calculations. I can't make an ocean with waves on it. And God just does that without any, he doesn't get tired of doing it. He just <laughs> a whole creation and it works that way. That yeah. even though I can understand it, it gives me a bigger appreciation of his power and his eternality and his care. And I mean, it, it makes me see how big God is. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this is actually a good segue into the next question, uh, which is about water, um, <laughs> because it is possible. So we've talked about aliens and those types of things, but it is possible. Uh, I remember when I talked with Dr. Ross and he said how now, this doesn't mean there's not life on some other planet we can't see, but he's talked about that the size of the universe is actually the smallest size to make one life sustaining planet. So I think sometimes people think that there's wasted space. There's not, yeah. you know, I know, I don't know the math, but you know, you physicists right. <laughs> have worked it out and it's like, it's, there's, there's no wasted space. It's actually what it took to make this. So um, with that being said, it is possible that earth is the only life sustaining planet. Um, and one reason that it, at least at this point, seems likely is because of the quantity of water on planet Earth. I was reading another book. Um, I can't remember where it is. But the, the, he kind of broke down the hydrological cycle. And I was even in more awe and, and right. just learning about that. But you said um, Earth's remarkable capacity. Let me see if I can pull this up. Uh, Earth's remarkable capacity to host a thriving and diverse array of life requires far more than liquid water. Mm -hmm. So, so first, I guess, what are some of those other requirements which do happen to be present on Earth? Well, there, there's this idea out there that where water is, life's going to happen. And, and you know, I, I mentioned some of these challenging discoveries. I'm like, okay, what do I? What does that do to my Christianity or and how I argue for it? Mm -hmm. The idea that we're finding water on Mars—that Mars was probably covered in liquid water when it was first formed. I'm like, what do I do with that? <laughs> There's some interesting science, and I'll get to that in a second. But as I went back and I'm like, okay, so what does Scripture have to say? Well, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void was hostile to life. It had no structure, no form, no structure, no nothing filling it. The earth was formless and void. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Mm. Think, Wait a second here. Yeah. The earth's covered in water and yet it's lifeless. Un you know, it's not suitable for life. It's hostile to life. Mm. What does God do? He transforms this water covered water somewhat water-rich world into a place that's thriving with life. Well, what are some of the things scientifically that we know have happened there? Among things that we can say that we know is that when Earth was first formed, it was covered in water and there were no planets. It had a very dense atmosphere. The oceans were a little more amorphous and ultimately, they had no oxygen in them. And, and we know some of that we know biblically, some of that we know scientifically. But so one of the key features that is that has played a role in transforming the earth from lifeless to thriving with life is plate tectonics. Because if if you're going to have an abundant amount of life on a planet, you need to have uh, continents. Uh, you can actually do a calculation of how much life is there on Earth. And if you ask the question, how much of that life lives on the continental shelves, the continents or the continental shelves, it's over two thirds of it. Mm -hmm. So continents are incredibly important to life. Mm -hmm. Now you ask the question, what do you need for continents? Well, if you want to get continents, you got to have plate tectonics. Right. The moment you start needing plate tectonics, what you need for that is you need very rigid plates that can move by and shove and go under, you know, subduct and everything and crash into each other. But you also need a planet with a very malleable, more fluid region right underneath it so that they could float around and move. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that if Earth is much larger, those plates get really thin and mm -hmm. the tectonic activity skyrockets. 
And if the earth gets much smaller, those, plate those plates get really thick and they cease very quickly. And that's actually what we see when we look at Mars. Hmm. We see evidence of past tectonic activity. We see it on both Mars and Venus. Okay. But that activity ceased long ago. Mars probably close to three and a half, four billion years ago with Venus probably two billion years ago. Okay. Now that plate tectonics and it's not, so it's not just water. You need tectonic activity, but you need both of them because water provides the lubricant that allows tectonic activity to happen. Mm -hmm. The tectonic activity provides the thermostat that keeps the temperature right so that the water doesn't evaporate and get wow. displaced into space. And so you see this harmony between tectonic activity and water. But it's not just that, because I, I mentioned a global thermostat. Well, that's related to the atmosphere, because if you were to take Earth's atmosphere away, instead of being 15 degrees above the freezing point of water for the average global temperature, it would be 30, 20, 15 degrees Celsius below the freezing point of water. Wow. So even with all the water and all the plate tectonics going on, Earth would be frozen. And that's even more exacerbated when you think what's going on with the sun. The sun's luminosity has increased steadily over time. Compared to what it is today, it was anywhere from 30 to 40% dimmer when the Earth formed. And so you've got the sun's luminosity increasing dramatically. You've got the atmospheric gases changing dramatically. You've got the surface structure of the Earth with the plates and the tectonic, the or the, the continents and the oceans changing dramatically. And in the midst of all of this, there's life on the Earth that is also changing dramatically. And all of these things that could very easily have caused Earth to become entirely uninhabitable. It could have frozen. All the water could have evaporated. It could have gotten a, an ice or a green or a, you know a greenhouse that would have overheated the earth. All of these things that could have happened. These incredibly massive changes have all worked together to keep Earth's global temperature within about twenty this twenty degree C window over the last four billion years. Hmm. That's incredible. That is incredible. And so you're not just saying is there a planet with water on it. You're saying, is there a planet where all of this stuff happened? And, and I would say this, I, I, I agree with what he was saying, that the chances of finding something like Earth, given what we know of what needs to happen, are beyond remote. Mm -hmm. would say the Earth, the universe isn't large enough so that we expect one of those. The Earth is, or the universe is, given how large the universe is, I wouldn't expect one of them. Only where God orchestrates the events so that it happens is where I would expect. Mm. That plays into my, you know, my my discussion about or our discussion about extraterrestrial life. So if we find extraterrestrial life, the question we're asking is, did God do it somewhere else too? Mm -hmm. See that He did a bunch of work here. Might He have done it somewhere else? I think that's a fascinating yeah. theological question. Yeah, <laughs> I agree. Well, um, got one more question, and we'll wrap up. Um, you wrote that the fine-tuned nature of the laws of physics, the purposeful events that could have destroyed Earth, but enhanced its ability to support life and the capacity of humans to understand it all, point to something outside of the physical universe that orchestrated the whole story. So I wanted just to um, end on this note where we can kind of bring it back as we approach Easter weekend here and you know, kind of what's it all mean, um, we're talking about astrophysics and, and all these principles, but the the bible is clear that it's about god relating to us or relating to man and getting us to reconcile with him and so how does this kind of um get us here from from that quote that you were writing well when i look at you know how the universe behaves the idea that the universe has a beginning and that it's to to produce the carbon and oxygen and hydrogen that life requires to have the right space time dimensions so that structures can form that that water is this amazing molecule that it is that carbon is this amazing element that it is that earth is the right size the right distance from its star the star is the right kind of star that's formed late enough that it has the heavier elements all of these things that play into there one you see in scripture that there's a purpose to creation i mean you just read the genesis creation account in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and this is the way it looked. And then God did, and then God said, and then God did. And there's this orderly, the purposefulness about what God is doing. 
that it just occurred to me, you know, as, as you read about God's attributes, one of the things you learn about God is that he is self-sufficient. And, and that's not quite the theological term, but I'm just going to say that there's nothing he's lacking. He doesn't need companionship. He didn't say, boy, I'm, I'm bored. Let's create a universe or wow. It'd be nice to have people to talk to. So no, he's, He's relational. He's a non-contingent being. Exactly. He's relational in his nature. He doesn't need any of this. So he creates this. And scripture is very clear that he creates it for a purpose. He creates it to be inhabited. And that just, when I think of the, 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 the significance of that, that here is this God who doesn't need Jeff Zwaring to exist. He doesn't need Alex to exist. He doesn't need anything to exist because he's just is and completely fulfilled in all ways. And yet he chooses to create a universe where we can exist and know him knowing that our rebellion is going to happen and that he is going to send the second person of the Godhead to take on human flesh, become fully God, fully man, knowing that he's going to do that. Solely, not that by me having a relationship with him, he's not enhanced, but he's inviting me into that relationship that he enjoys throughout eternity. Mm. That says something about how valuable I am, how valuable you are, how valuable each and every human being is, because we're all created in his image. You know, and as we're coming up on Easter, we get to celebrate the phenomenally loving event of Christ dying on the cross to pay for our sins. But the act of creation is every bit as loving. The act of making all of this so that, not just so that we can live here, but so that we can live here and, and understand how this creation works and see his signatures. He's just done so much for us that he didn't need to, but he lavished his grace on us as it describes in Ephesians. And so I just think it's a, when I stop to think about it, I'm just reminded of how valuable I am to God, how valuable each and every person, and he wants each and every person to enjoy that relationship with him. And so let's accept his offer of that because it is the best place you can be. Amen. <laughs> that is a beautiful way to end it. Um, Dr. Zwirink, Zwirink, sorry. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, thank you for your work, everybody. You can actually go call and get a copy of Testable Faith. Um, it's it's a relatively short book. It's not, I, I wouldn't say it's light reading, but it's it's uh, some complex concepts kind of packaged down for us, the rest of us. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you for the work you do with Reasons to Believe and, and with Gamma Rays. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and I appreciate uh, everybody in the chat. Um, and until next time, peace. Oh, 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 oh,